Hey everybody, welcome to part one of what's going to be a six-part series on the Northern Snakehead. Now I want to keep this intro really short so we can get straight to the material, but there are two points I need to cover. Number one, who is John Odenkirk and why should you consider him an authoritative voice on the topic of Northern Snakehead? And two, how did I arrive at the title for this series, which is Northern Snakehead Truth? Because calling anything truth can make it pretty controversial pretty quick. So point number one. John is currently a fisheries biologist at the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. In 1985, he earned his bachelor's in fishery science from Virginia Tech. And in 1987, he earned his master's from Tennessee Tech in fisheries biology. Now, he worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Florida up until 1989 and afterward returned back to Virginia. In 2004, when the northern snakehead was first discovered, you want to call it that, in the tidal Potomac waters between Maryland and Virginia, he was the guy who was tapped for the research focus on this species. What are their qualities? What are their attributes? What's, going to be, what's the impact going to be? And what is the impact on the native species in the area? John's that guy. <laughs> he's been with it pretty much since the beginning. So he has an extensive amount of experience with the species, uh, coming up on two decades now. So... In the meantime, or since then, he's actually been tapped by the fisheries biology community. They are expecting the northern snakehead to eventually make it into the Mississippi River Valley. And once they make it there, with all the tributaries that the Mississippi River has, they can get pretty much anywhere. So, they called John. The people up there responsible for fisheries called John and said, John, what is the deal with the northern snakehead? What should we expect? What are the mitigation strategies? What's the impact you're seeing? And as a result, he and the Virginia chapter of the American Fishery Society organized the first International Snakehead Symposium. And it's largely a result of that meeting, which had experts from around the country and around the world. It's the findings from that meeting that largely prompted me to make this video series. That and what brings me to point number two, why I chose to call this Northern Snakehead Truth. And I called it that because truth is what you use to combat misinformation. And there is a wealth of misinformation on this species out there, driven largely by media sensationalism. Because essentially what sells more ad space, what sells more time, what sells more views? Hey, here's the northern snakehead, here's a balanced view of what it is. Or, it's the frankenfish, it's going to kill everything, the native species are doomed, it's an invasion. You know? <laughs> that's what we were really told in the beginning of this, and that's just... Folks, that's not the reality, all right? To date, from all the scientific studies done to date in the Maryland, Virginia area, there is zero evidence of ecological, biological, or economic harm. So, I know that sounds sensational if you haven't been or had this information made available to you, all the scientific studies. So that's why I made this series. So I'll stop right there. No more intro. Let's get straight to the video. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Steve Camboris here, Cambo Trout, and I'm here, with Mr. John Odenkirk, and we're going to talk snakehead today. All right, we've got a lot of questions. Some of them for you, some of them for me. I'm trying to get to the bottom line truth because there's been a lot of misinformation over the years, a lot of sensationalism. Whatever the truth is, that's where we're going to go. It's where we let the truth lead us, let the evidence lead us. But compared to what you've probably heard about the frankenfish and the snakehead killing everything in the water traveling over land and you know attacking dogs and everything else you're probably going to find out something a little bit different out here uh, but the first thing i really want to touch on here is the thing that we hear all the time and that's that they're invasive now in layman's terms invasive usually means they're from another place they've been introduced but john in, in terms of what invasive means from like a fisheries biologist perspective could you run us through that real quick sure Sure. Pleasure to be here with you this morning. Yeah. <laughs> nice morning to talk about snakeheads. So, so you just you just made a statement about being from a different place and invasive. So that would I'd more hopefully accurately determine that to be exotic yep. or non-native, and, and and which almost everything in this lake is exotic or non-native, like largemouth bass and black crappie and walleye and muskie. All those fish that we love uh, and manage for in this lake. Um, are not native or exotic, but nobody, at least not now, would classify those fish as invasive. So why do people classify the snakehead as invasive? The federal government has defined it as invasive, and, and begrudgingly, my superiors have ordered me to refer to the northern snakehead as invasive because the feds have deemed it so. 
Um, my problem is within the definition that the feds are using. And that basically says, I mean, for me, pure and simple, whether you're exotic or not, to be an invasive, you have to have, you have to show harm. Okay. If it's, if you're not showing harm, then how is something invasive? It, it, at least that's my take on it. If you go to the, any definition you want to and look it up, typically that word is associated with ecological harm, environmental harm, economic harm, um, some sort of, of damage to the resource or to the economy or to somebody that's you know doing making a living or doing something related to that but this is where it gets sticky the feds say or may mm. cause damage Man. and so that's what in the snakehead the poster child for invasive is somehow now with no empirical evidence or scientific data really to back it up other than a comic strip that was cited by that one federal official back in the early 2000s um, it's, it's really astonishing that it got to the point where it got and, and the level of hysteria and misinformation basically has driven, made this fish a culprit with, with no evidence. And I'm not saying that the fish is, is not invasive. It may very well be. If your definition of invasive is being a good colonist and, and um, dispersing in a newly colonized area and increasing your population and your stature in the community, then yeah, okay, it does that. It has done that and will continue to do that. But in the wake, okay, what do we see? Uh, are we seeing devastation? Are we seeing impacts? And so far, no, we're not. So the concern is that maybe in a different area, different, not just Lake or not the Potomac River, but in an area that may be more sensitive or maybe have endangered species, maybe there's a situation that you could envision where maybe the snakeheads could do some truly invasive work and, and do some harm to something that we, we don't want to harm. So that's the, the big thing, and you said we're going to get to the truth in your, your intro. And, and I don't know that <laughs> we really to, can to, yeah. get to a truth yet because it's too early to say. The jury's still out, and it's going to be time. Even though we're working on two decades now of this experiment in the Potomac River, and, and so far I, I think we're, we're pretty comfortable in saying that we haven't been able to discern any impacts. And, and my, my critics will say, well, you haven't measured everything. And that's true. We haven't measured everything. But what we do know is the things that they like to eat the most are more abundant now than, than when they got here. So that, that gives us some cause for, for maybe comfort. And that last thing you said is a great point that I really want to go into because yeah. when I hear people talk about snakehead being introduced, they see the ecosystem as a zero-sum game. If the snakehead are being added, they're going to compete for a static forage base. And as a result, they're going to outcompete and reduce the populations of other species at the same trophic level, like largemouth bass, for example. That's a great example. So I read um, from your notes from the Snakehead Symposium this past year right. that one thing you looked at was killifish was a primary forage within the Potomac. Is that right? Right. right. But at the same time Snakehead had been introduced, killifish populations have increased. Right. So to people who see it as a zero-sum game, how do you explain that? Well, especially when we're talking about not just lake but the tidal potomac river system it's a big complex system there's highly variable recruitment meaning spawning success of all the populations both predators and prey and these things are changing in context every last year was the wettest year we've ever recorded uh, there's all these different variables that go into this very complicated ecosystem and community balance sort of thing and and when you look at the densities what, what, when i when you start talking about competition of snakeheads and bass and and predator prey relationships i think what's important to do is, is keep things in context and that is when we're looking at the relative abundance of snakeheads we see in the potomac river and we go out and we measure that by electrofishing and how many fish do we catch in an hour of sample time um, so, in, for instance, in largemouth bass, right now in the Potomac, times are good, and, and we're catching a lot of bass. So, it, it, depending on what creek we're in in the spring, in, in April and May, we might be catching anywhere from 75 to 125 bass an hour. That's a, that's a high catch rate of bass per hour. Relatively, snakeheads in that same in those same creeks, um, typically now we're getting maybe 10. Um, Aquia, one of the higher catch rates, we're using around 20 an hour. So, I mean, we're almost a magnitude of difference lower on snakeheads than bass. And, and the thing about the Potomac is it's actually a fish factory. It's a productive system. There's forage. I mean, they're eating all kinds. We get like 20 to 30 different food organisms that snakeheads consume. They're opportunistic. So they're not out there just working on one particular uh, organism or one prey item. They're, whatever swims in front of their face, when they're hungry, they'll eat it. Um, and and they're, not, they're not voracious. They, they typically, one of the biggest complaints I hear from anglers is, is they got lockjaw. They can't give them a bite. They oh, see yeah. the fish. Like, it's oh, like fishing yeah. for cobia. You, know, you can see them <laughs> throw all kinds of baits at them, and they won't bite because they're not yep. hungry. Um, so 
So th I think that's important to realize that we, we're not really having competition at this point, I don't think, based on the numbers of those fish. We have dietary overlap, but the two aren't the same. You know, for, to have competition, you have to have a limitation on that forage. And, and at this point, I would argue that we haven't seen that. Not that we might not see it, but at the levels of abundance that we're seeing now, I just don't think it's happening. All right. Now, we touched on this, but just to hit it again, one of the other questions that you hear a lot is, based on what you've seen thus far, empirically speaking, from the studies, what impact have snakehead have on bass fisheries? Now, you said in the Potomac that they've seen the bass either, ma either maintain or increase. In a past video, you said that you saw that the snakehead looked like they may have been hitting a point of equilibrium in the environment with their population levels. Right. Um, could you touch on, I guess, sure. one, one more time, just to drive the point home. Right. What impact has it had on like largemouth bass fisheries as an example? Okay, well, I'm going to give you two quick examples. One is Lake here uh, and a similar lake, Lake which is a little smaller lake than this down the road, that is, are owned by the agency. So we didn't want snakeheads in our public fishing lakes, <laughs> um, but they were illegally stocked. Oh, yeah. And we yeah. rescued we arrested and prosecuted. I get, I get both of those in one word. Oh, you called them. We, we, we caught you them. Caught them. <clears throat> and that was before we increased the penalty to a class one misdemeanor. Now they're going to have to hire a lawyer if they do it. But before they just got a bit of a slap on the wrist, but they still got convicted. Um, but the bottom line was we ended up with snakeheads in our lakes that we have copious data. I mean, we've surveyed these lakes ad nauseum for decades and decades and decades. So we've got trap netting data, gill netting data, electrofishing data. We know what these fish populations look like. Uh, for, the, for the past X number of years. And now, we, all of a sudden, boom, you have a, a treatment of snakeheads being stocked. So we have an outdoor laboratory. Oh, yeah. And we've begun to watch this happen here so far, but it's very early to tell here. The flip side of that is the Tidal River, where we have 15 plus years of data. And so if you trend the snakehead population and the large enough bass population over time, we weren't looking in the Potomac River before 2004, which is when the snakeheads showed up, because we didn't really have any reason to. Maryland owned the river. Occasionally, we'd go into the Virginia creeks to, to, to usually test for anadromous fish, um, river shad, you know, herring, stripers, and things like that. But we were real interested in 04 when the snakeheads showed up because that was a concern. You know, yep. Will the snakeheads outcompete bass? Will the population shift? So I honestly don't have good data before the snakeheads showed up. But if you just plot the trend line of bass from 2004 to present, it is an upper trend. There you go. All right. And, I, and, and the snakehead trend is, if you plot it, it's going to be pretty flat. But, it, but if, you, if you treat it as a nonlinear function, which I think is more accurate, it's a peaking function. See, what you, you have is the population increasing rapidly to around 2012, 2013, when it seemed to reach a peak and stabilize for a few years, and then it actually started to decline. So I, but I think what has happened is, is the two populations aren't really having any effect on each other. They're just functioning independently based on variables that are affecting their populations, which again are not related. They're, they're environmental, um, they're you know, other, primarily environmental, but related to other factors. So, so, so the two things are acting independently of one another. That is the snakehead densities and the large mat bass densities, in my belief. All right. But we do want to remind folks not to be remo moving live fish, and that's that's the tough thing. People would always that's and that's the big this, mi this miscommunication. Is the part I was going to hit on, but yeah. just, the, pay People attention say, here. You, you had to kill. You got to kill the fish, don't you? And I said, no, 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 no. No, you, no. I don't think there's any government entity anywhere that can force somebody to kill something. Okay, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you go to court, you're not going to get convicted because nobody can force you to kill something. Yeah. It's, the whole thing is just it's specious. It's, it doesn't hold water. Um, but the way we get you is we say you can't possess a live one. Yep. So we, Virginia doesn't consider the removing a hook, or excuse me, removing a hook, a fish from a hook, that's not possession. Okay, if you catch a fish and you're unhooking it, you're not yet in possession of that fish. So you can release it alive. Totally fine, legal. However, if you put the fish on a stringer, if you put it in a live well, if you put it in a cooler, now you are in possession of the fish and technically you can't be alive with a snakehead. Almost nobody is following that, but bear in mind that you could be cited for it. Um. So to summarize that point, in, in Maryland, for example, you can catch a snakehead, you can release a snakehead, but only in the waters in which you caught that snakehead. Correct. But don't have a live one on you. Right. Then I, I guess that's the bottom line right there. Right. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's another one out there that that's a good point to touch on. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed part one of what's going to be a six-part series on the northern snakehead. So in the succeeding videos to this series, we're going to cover a lot more information. We're going to cover the findings from the International Snakehead Symposium, because we've hardly scratched the surface on that. We'll cover what they eat, 
We'll cover how they reproduce, what habitat they like, all of that. All of that information we're going to get into. The next installment of these series should come out every Friday, pending me having the time to edit it and have it released. Okay, Every Friday afternoon, I'll try to have these in the, in the succeeding weeks until this six-part series is exhausted. So I could, talk, I could talk snakehead all day long. I really could. But I'll, I'll leave you with this last note right here. I'm not afraid of controversial topics, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't make this video and put it out there. However, let's do our best together to keep this a constructive conversation. If you disagree with something, by all means, voice your opinion. Put forth the evidence to counter whatever's been put forth in this video. But let's do it insofar as possible civilly. All right. I don't know about you, but I hate drama. I hate, hate, hate drama. Okay. <laughs> so instead of flinging crap back and forth at each other, let's try to keep it civil. Make your argument, cite your evidence, and we'll go from there. All right? Because the quickest way to defeat your purpose, like presumably if you're commenting here, right? If, presumably if you're commenting, you're trying to sway people to a certain position that will cause them to take certain actions which you view as beneficial. Right? The quickest way to defeat your purpose in that area is to start personally attacking people. Because once you start attacking people, the conversation deteriorates, it shuts down, and it just becomes a crap flinging match. And what's the point, folks? That's not how I want to spend my time. I doubt it's how you want to spend your time. So let's try to keep it civil. Cite your evidence, make your argument. Okay? So um, thanks much to Fishing Maryland, and thanks much to anyone else who shares this video. Share it far and wide. Let's keep the discussion going. All right? And aside from that, if you have any questions or comments, let me know, and have a good one. Holy what? Nice one. Buzz bait. That was a nice hit, dude. You lost him? Oh, no, no, I still got her. Nope. There she is. Oh, there she goes. There she goes. <laughs>